Before history is written, it's played. Before it's frozen in time, it's fought one shift at a time. Before it's etched in silver, it's carved in ice. What happens next will last forever. The Stanley Cup Final on ABC and ESPN Plus begins Saturday. I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on Earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city <laughs> on earth. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie, and I'm Bathsheba. Oh no. Well, I'm so sorry, Bathsheba. <laughs> 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 That's yeah, really some, unfortunate yeah. for you. Um, but yes, welcome y'all to the last installment of our Conjuring House Deep Dive. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to episode one and two, definitely go back and listen to those because a lot of this will not make sense to you if you haven't caught up yet. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, hello, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Um, welcome. Yes, welcome. Uh, we are going to the Conjuring House in two days. Two days. Two days. From when you are hearing Next this. Next time you hear us talk about the Conjuring House, it will be in retrospect. Yes. <laughs> yes. If we make it out if alive. If we make it. Yes. Yeah. If Rhode Island weather doesn't kill us first. We are actually doing a podcast inside of the Conjuring that House. That is yes. We're doing, I think it's like one of the first podcasts ever shot inside of a Conjuring House. I think that's, I asked the, the, uh, the owner. Awesome. Very nice. Yeah, which very is pretty cool. cool. Very, that very is pretty cool. cool. Breaking, breaking frozen ground. Breaking frozen ground. Uh, <laughs> yes, it will be quite frozen. Um, but yes, welcome. Uh, we are going to be deep diving into the last portions of the history, um, some of Andrea's thoughts and theories on the house. We're also going to be discussing our personal thoughts, our wrap up of our thoughts and theories before we go into the house. And then... Uh, yeah, it's going to be a pretty interesting episode, y'all. This has been a very enlightening experience of trying to wrap my brain around this mess of a house. Uh, paranormal mess, I should say, because mm -hmm. it feels like every day it changes a little bit. Yeah, there, there are new new things coming up, uh, new new avenues to explore. Um, old stories get blown out of the water because mm -hmm. uh, you come in with an expectancy. You, you kind of right. know the story based on just the legend that has always been, you know, if you've been following the the Warrens for any period of time, or if you saw the movie, you kind of have an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even when you were doing research, when the movie came out, we were still just cresting. Exactly. What was actually out there. Um, and then, um, thankfully, um, Andrea uh, Perrin wrote a three volume book exactly. on the subject that gave you so much insight as to what happened. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so we're excited to uh, to get out there and, and experience it for ourselves. Yes, it is quite, quite the ride. Yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, first off, we do want to say if you are a para junkie, you're going to get almost a 12 hour live stream. Hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, the ghosts don't mess with our equipment. We're going to if as long there will be live streaming there happening will be live streaming. regularly throughout. We're going to try to make it one continuous 12 hour. But if it isn't, we'll be scrambling, grabbing our phones, yep. doing all kinds of craziness to exactly. ensure that you get as much of the experience as possible. Exactly. And this is a dry run of what what is going to become a regular occurrence for us. Yeah. Because after the Conjuring House, we've got Waverly Hills mm -hmm. coming yeah. up. Which is very exciting. Oh, Waverly Hills. Yeah, we're going to Waverly Hills and Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, so that's going to be super cool. Uh, you know, everybody loves a good tuberculosis death shoot. Um, so <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, Woo! everyone listening to this podcast does exactly. No, that's fair. <laughs> if you if you if you're here, you know. <laughs> you know, it's a good time. Um, but yes, so we're also going to start a new little segment for when we go on these big investigations. Um, if you've been around a while, or if you're new here, we have our editor Debria, uh, who is quite the comical hoot and a half, and um, we realize this. 
this that she scares very easily. She's um, highly reactive in in frightening situations. Yeah, we what she is? I know. We <laughs> took her to Washington, Georgia, with us um, because she also helps JT film pretty much, and. Um, yeah, she she had a hard time there. So, so it'll be interesting. We're gonna lock her in the cellar with her consent. Um, <laughs> and begrudging consent, but consent. But it is consent. Uh, we're gonna lock her in the cellar for thirty minutes or so by with, herself with the pair junkies. With the pair junkies. So she'll have stream. the pair junkies with her. Yes. Um, and we also recently got 360 camera capabilities. Yes, so we did. as long as that goes well, because that's also a dry run for us, we're gonna put the 360 camera down in the cellar and so that you can literally sit and feel like you're sitting in the cellar of the conjuring house. Yep. Um, I'm gonna put it in a couple different places because I okay. want I want people to be able to put their VR goggles on or just like, you know, hold their cell phone up and like see what it's like in there. Because right. everyone's like so curious about what it's like in there. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that'll be really cool. So uh, definitely if you have been on the edge of becoming a pair junkie, now is the best time to do it because mm -hmm, you want mm -hmm, to be mm -hmm. involved in these live streams, I promise. But but anywho, let's dive right on into our last episode. And we're kicking it off strong. We're starting with Bathsheba Sherman, everybody's favorite witch. Yes. <laughs> Which is so unfair to her. Um, history has really shafted her. But it, 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 but there is a great deal of difficulty around this. It's because history doesn't keep really clean records of a yes. lot of things. And so what we do know and what we speculate and then what we realize are oftentimes they don't they don't come to the same road. Mm -hmm. So um, now this information came to Carolyn first um, because she was starting to do research into the um, property and the house and all that. So she went to talk to the town historian. Um, so according to the town historian, they seem to believe that courts um, the courts worked very diligently uh, to separate. Um, fiction from fact, and it came to when it came to Bathsheba Sherman. There's a lot of people who thought that she should be burned at the stake. Those were at the times when people proclaimed her as a witch, accused of performing a satanic ritual resulting in sacrifices of an infant. It was all too gruesome in the mind bending description of a baby convulsing, then dying due to a needle impaled in its skull. Lord. That people went hard on yeah. Bathsheba. Um, yeah. They could not find any of the records for this, mind you. Um, fixing the location of what she would plea as an accidental death, but that Bathsheba was an Arnold. She lived in the Arnold estate at that age, so there was every indication to believe that the event occurred um, in the home where the parent family was living. Now, there is no written history of the life Bath of Bathsheba Sherman or records regarding the death of the infant. A lot of it is now folklore that are mostly scary um, stories handed down over the generations. And she really has just become more of a punchline than a p persona. So, okay, okay. Uh, now, there is this elderly man named, I am definitely not going to pronounce his last name right, Mr. McChurn. McKeechurn. 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 I like McKeechurn. McKeechurn. Um, yeah. <laughs> who also knew Bathsheba when she was a child. Um, or when he was a child. And he tried to describe it to Carolyn. That, um, But what he claimed was that Bathsheba was a bitch from hell. Oh, my Lord. So... Carolyn then uh, began to wonder if she was buried somewhere on the Arnold estate, perhaps under the unmarked bellstone out on her property near the old cellar hole. Um, that is not the case. They did eventually find Bathsheba Sherman's um, grave, and it is not on the property. So interesting point to note. But just because it's a family property doesn't mean that everybody in the family is buried on the property. Right. Uh, that does happen sometimes. People sometimes. create family cemeteries, um, well, graveyards, I guess, but... Um, now Lorraine Warren would be the one that really gave Bathsheba the n notoriety, if you will, because when she first entered the home, um, she felt this demonic presence, but she also got the name Bathsheba. So she just put the two together. So she assumed that it was Bathsheba. That was this very wicked and evil entity that was trying to harm the family. Um, which, honestly, none of the family really hold that against Lorraine Warren uh, for mis 
judging. I mean, which is fair in the scheme of things, because when you have those type of psychic intuitions, I guess, they're not always going to make the most sense. It's very hard to decipher. So she's probably just. Well, and keep in mind that five children had very fresh memories of a beloved pet named Bathsheba dying. Right. So the name may be hanging in the air just That's in grief and just in, you know, and so the fact that the name of the dog and this local legend happened to coalesce. Um, and in a lot of ways, uh, I think Ed Warren went a little too hard on the Bathsheba's a witch thing. Right. Um, Cause he definitely, uh, and you, you can hear it in interviews. He, he, he not only called out Bathsheba, but absolutely definitively stated she killed children, gave them to the devil, did all of this stuff. To, and, and all, so all of that ritualistic belief, it's like, mm, what are you using as your source material? Right. You know, um, because, if locally people are like, yeah, because uh, even even in the the legend of Bathsheba, it seems like there's there's a split in what happened because uh, a lot of people say that Bathsheba was was very young, taking care of a child, and the mm -hmm. child died in her care, um, and that created this idea that oh, she murdered the child, but young children had low life expectancy. Yeah, infant mortality <laughs> you know, was a infant thing. Infant mortality was a real thing. So it was, it was, it's definitely one of those things. And somebody, I, I think I read somewhere that somebody believed that uh, Bathsheba was actually a, a blood relative of, of one of the women who uh, was executed at the Salem witch trial, oh. you know, creating all of these backwards linked things. But of course, that's just easy to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's easy to speculate. Oh, yeah. You know. It also doesn't help she has a name like Bathsheba. Bathsheba is such a, a dramatic name. It is. <laughs> it is a dramatic name. It is. Well, and it sounds like something that would be in, like, the Bible thumping version of, you know, um, the Bible. It's uh, It sounds like an evil person. It is name. an Old Testament name, and it, it, it yeah. does conjure images of, you know. Um, but <laughs> he found images that, yes. of you know righteousness and and mm -hmm. and uh, and righteous fury. <laughs> exactly. So, as um, Carolyn continued researching, she found out that children had drowned in the nearby creek, um, which they have on the property. Right. It's the Nipmuc uh, River, and um, that's actually. Where one, uh, so Oliver, um, April's friend, if you will, uh, that was how he passed. He drowned on the property. Right. One was murdered, allegedly. Sure. Um, and so many people died there. Uh, women specifically, uh, Arnold Richardson and a baker, uh, which would make sense for the Baker boys. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, only a few of the family names that were discovered to be associated with the property records indicated multiple deaths had occurred there, and relatively few of these were documented with complete details. Sure. Now, Mrs. Arnold, Mrs. John Arnold, y'all remember her? Uh, she hanged herself in the barn. Yep. Uh, wow. Mrs. Arnold was in her 90s at the time, and she committed suicide. Um, so that was also... Uh, when they found out that Bathsheba lived to be an old woman as well, which kind of negated the whole story of like Bathsheba was a young woman sure, when this sure. incident happened. Because I think most people went along the lines that she was older when the baby was killed, which, you know, adds to like the old witch kills babies and eats them. And <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, because a lot of the stories seem to suggest that the death happened when she was young and then she just cared, she became a pariah. Right. Like everyone just, oh, she's the baby killing witch for the rest of her life. Like, you know, 60 plus years sure. of, of, of being, you know, treated or, or, or maligned or, or, you know, walk on the other side of the street from her kind of thing. And do you think a part of that has to do with the fact that she, I believe was unmarried, which I is very frowned upon. Don't know if that's correct either. Really? And I say that because she's a Sherman. <laughs> Oh, that's and, a good point. And, yeah. And so I, I do believe she was married. And 
And I do believe she had children, but I don't think any of them lived. However, again, God, infant that mortality. Help her. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Infant mortality being high. Uh, and, and again, it, it gets tricky because it's like, what are the sources that are coming through with this? You know, um, because the the Sherman part of it is uh, they didn't live on the um, Arnold property. Mm-hmm. They lived on the Sherman property, which is next property over. So outside of the research stuff, it wasn't just the parent family that was being affected by the entities of right. this house. If you came into their lives, oftentimes you were affected. Um, really? Yes. So okay. the milder situation was with Kathy, you know, um, Carolyn's best friend. So Kathy had gone up to Nova Scotia for a while and she fell in love with a man and they were going to get married and all this. And so Kathy came back one September and she was trying to just see Carolyn. She knew Carolyn wasn't doing well. She knew her and Roger were having issues, yada, yada, yada. And Kathy left because she couldn't stand the smell in the house Mm. and she couldn't handle like being in the house. When she was driving home that night, she looked in her back seat and there was an entity with gnarled, sharp yellow teeth. Ooh. Oh, perfectly. Mm-hmm. And so, and Kathy, um, and Kathy got home and called Carolyn and Carolyn yelled at the ghosts being like, you cost me my friendship. And this caused a major contention <laughs> for Carolyn. Um, wow. Because Carolyn uh, felt that Kathy was never going to come back over. And now right. she's even okay. more isolated from even right. her best friend. Right, right, right. And then one of the girls, and I believe it was Nancy, made friends with another little girl named Lenora, okay. who lived nearby. It's very Edgar Allan Poe. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so Lenora would come over and play with Nancy, and they were just thick as thieves, all of this. And one day, Lenora's family house caught on fire, and they all burned alive. Whoa! What? See, I yeah. was not. I was not going there. What? <laughs> I was not traveling yeah. that that path. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and if you remember from the last uh, podcast, we discussed uh, a fireballs coming off of mm-hmm. one of the um, uh, Caroline witnessed. Yeah, like the first time yeah. she saw the. Yeah, the dresser. The saw the, uh, yeah, yeah, the dresser. The dresser. Yes, the dresser. The dresser. It was a couple days before right. they uh, they first encountered the broke neck lady. Right. Wow. But yeah, a little girl and her whole family perished in flames after becoming friends yeah, with but, the parent family. I mean, that, sure, but I but, mean that's not you can't that's not like immediate. Sh- that's horrible, but it's not immediately. My mind doesn't go to haunting. It's just hard weird. to say. You know, it's just weird, uh, though. It's interesting it, to know. If 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 you're following the story of a friend shows up and as she leaves, she sees this yeah. entity in the backseat of her car. A friend shows up, yeah. goes home, and her house catches on fire. You know, yeah, houses sure. catch on fire. Tragedies happen. Yeah. That's true. But when you start looking at a wider web sure. of connection, you're like, mm, it, it doesn't bode well. Yeah, Because, yeah, you can't say – Definitively, yeah. They also might not have blown a candle out. So. Well, exactly, sure, you know. <laughs> but the point is, is yeah, that yeah, yeah. calamity. Calamity yeah. is. It's more fun to think this. Though. You're right. <laughs> well, it's well, just that it's it's bizarre. It's bizarre that yeah, absolutely, and it almost feels like, particularly the broke neck lady mm-hmm. who seems to have a lot of power. I mean, she's controlling yeah. people's streams. She's attacking people. She's doing a lot of things. She'd be busting up chalkboards. She do be. Well, I don't think that was her, oh, okay. but I think that was just another n- annoyed spirit, if you will. But um, yeah. yeah, it's just the point is <laughs> that it's compelling enough that it feels like it, the, whatever this entity is, is trying to isolate them sure. even more sure. by keeping people away from them. Yeah, that would make and, sense. and it, that would it, make sense. it also goes to that concept of it's easy for us to suggest, well, that's a normal thing to happen. But then you ask yourself, how many families do I know were entirely killed in a house fire yeah. in my life? Right. You know, if I if I were to think of all the house fires that ever occurred around me, which are few, actually, yeah. when it comes down to it, how many of them result in the deaths of everyone in the house? Mm hmm. I don't have that. Like there, seven. Yeah. In my life, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can't think of a single house fire that resulted in someone's death that I knew personally. Really? Mm-hmm. And okay. I've known a lot of people. Uh, so that becomes kind of this interesting thing where it's like, oh, yeah, that's – that's because we also think of like murder as like 
just this rampant, crazy thing. But a lot of people go their whole lives without ever knowing a single person who was murdered. That's true. You yeah, know? that's very true. And and but we make it commonplace because we talk about things right. like this and we talk about you know ghosts and and stuff. But these are such amazingly rare occurrences mm-hmm. that you have to say, well, if there's a commonplace that does that, it becomes compelling in right. conversation. Exactly. Um, now, when it comes to the Warrens, everybody's favorite uh, paranormal couple. Um, interestingly enough, the parents never reached out to the Warrens. I know that they show in the film, um, they show Carolyn coming to one of the Warrens' like speeches. Lectures, yeah. yeah, exactly. And she comes up to them and is like begging them to come to her house. That doesn't happen. Um, somebody actually told them that they were having problems. And There's a ghost hunting group from um, from Providence, mm. uh, and and they were just basically following up on on kind of the rumor mill of, exactly. of haunted places. So um, so yeah, I, I want to say that it was like another, and I want to say it was like a group of college kids, yeah, who were like, "We're ghost hunters," and they're like, "Oh no, this isn't good." <laughs> exactly. Um, it was Keith Johnson who had contacted the Warrens, um, saying that the family needed help. And so the Warrens showed up on the night bef- uh, of Halloween in 1973. <laughs> Sounds like the perfect night. Well, like, it's, uh, it's very dramatic. It's yes. A, yeah. So they came um, for that because they felt the veil between the physical world and the spirit world would be at its thinnest point, giving them the ideal com- opportunity to communicate with the spirits in the area. Which is old world seance style, you know. Yeah, it's, it's it, it makes sense why they choose that. It's a pretty well accepted idea. We've talked about it on this mm-hmm. podcast before that mm-hmm. you know, as you go into fall, the the veil is thin, and yes, yeah. So it makes sense. Um, but Lorraine Warren had a sense and had a vision of a spirit. She called Bathsheba, proclaiming her a purely evil entity, portraying her as one of those doing the devil's footwork on Earth who deliberately killed an infant in the house in the bedroom where Roger and Carolyn slept. Mm, That's a bold claim. That's a very bold claim. claim. Um, She likewise claimed to to physically be into the spirit, sensing her presence within two specific rooms. Uh, assuring Carolyn she was demonic in nature, Satan's foot soldier at war with a living soul attempting to capture what she covered. Um, now, Miss Warren identified um, Bathsheba as a nefarious and malignant force feeding off the energy in their house and with a voracious appetite for husbands. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, she believed that it dwelled in the cellar near the well directly beneath their bedroom. So that's where we're going to put Debria. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so they decided they needed to do a seance or what is perceived as the exorcism in um, the actual Conjuring movie, which is not really an exorcism. Um, I don't believe they ever even reached the point where they asked for permission to do an exorcism on this home because no. nobody was possessed. Um, I think no. they were more so just trying to figure out what was happening. Right. Um, so over the 10 years that the family lived in the house, the Warrens made multiple trips to investigate. Now this number has fluctuated. I've heard six trips right. and all sorts of random things. But um, at one point, Lorraine conducted a seance to attempt to contact the spirits that were possessing the family. And during the seance, Carolyn Perrin became possessed, speaking in tongues and rising from the ground in her chair. Andrea says, my mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not her own. Her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room, the event almost killing her. My mother's body was rolled into a ball. It was absolutely heart stopping hearing her scream, watching her writhing in pain. I thank God every day she has no memory of it, although she remembers everything else perfectly well. Mm-hmm. My mother was co- knocked unconscious. The priest was quivering in the corner of the room, white as a sheet. You, it's got to be pretty bad if yeah. the priest is quivering in the in the corner. But everyone else who witnessed it, myself included, was dumbstruck by a horror show stunned into silence. 
After the seance, Roger kicked the Warrens out, worried about his wife's mental stability. Famously, he punched Ed Warren. He punched yes. Ed Warren in the face. Yes, which uh, not, sounds laid on him par. Out. Yeah. yeah, sounds like sounds on par for Roger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and it's interesting to take because Roger's take on it was, you know, they kind of barged into their lives. They they did this without any true plan Mm -hmm. the result of it was so uh you know uh seemingly dangerous uh and then ed tried to body check roger from going to his wife like got Mm -hmm. in in between his his unconscious wife on the floor and was like stay back exactly it's like "Mm, that's not gonna work (laughs) right and um, so Roger kicked them out. And according to Andrea, the family continued to live in the house due to financial instability, because as you know from the first episode, um, they were poor because of this house. Right. And so they weren't able to move until 1980. Um, now, it's important to note that I, uh, the Warrens did come back to visit the parent family one time after the uh, the roger kicking them out but it was mostly just to check in on them right and to make see, sure and also to make sure that carolyn, <laughs> that carolyn was alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now moving into andrea's opinions on ed and lorraine warren um so ed and lorraine warren walked into our house the night before halloween in 1973 my mother and father had no idea who they were when they came to the kitchen door, but my mother let them in and Mrs. Warren came into the kitchen and she walked over to the old black stove, put her hand on the corner, and then she just covered her eyes and she said, I sense the malignant presence in this house. Her name is Bathsheba. Forty years after moving out of that house, I was with Lorraine Warren at a private screening of The Conjuring a few months before it was released. That day... Um, She said to me that she was sorry because she and Ed were in over their heads the moment they crossed the threshold of that house. They just didn't know it yet. Wow. But I will go to, Andrea says, I will go to my own grave believing that they did everything in their power to help us. They just didn't know how. In fact, it was on Ed's deathbed that he begged his wife to tell our story in whatever way she could because he described their investigation of the farmhouse as the most intense, most compelling, most disturbing, and most significant of all the investigations they ever conducted over the more than 40 years as paranormal researchers. Now, uh, Andrea's thoughts on Bathsheba because she has very strong opinions about Bathsheba. Now, she doesn't believe that Bathsheba was the demon. I think we're all in agreement right, yeah. on that. Um, but Bathsheba Sherman had a bad reputation for being very mean spirited. No pun intended. Um, but she did not live there. She was born of the Thayer family and married Judson Charman about a mile and a half away. But there were only a few homesteads. So naturally, all the neighbors knew each other. Apparently, a baby died in her care. And there was an inquest regarding the death of the infant that said that a needle had been found impaled at the base of the skull. I mean, that's pretty. That baby had been pissed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is pretty damning of as evidence, Bathsheba. But, uh, but that could have been a terrible accident. Um, sure. Um, we don't really know, and I don't think that you should accuse someone of murder unless you've got some real evidence to back up that claim. Um. She lived with that terrible dark cloud over her her whole life, and I cannot absolve her of guilt. I don't know what the circumstances were, but I can be her great defender, and I have been. Unfortunately, when Miss Warren decided that she felt a dark presence in the house and said it was Bathsheba, then everything that happened in the house got blamed on Bathsheba. And that's just not the case at all. I just don't believe that, and I've had spirit connection with Bathsheba, even at her own gravestone, which is compelling in itself. Right, Um, yeah. Yes. I've heard disembodied voices. She comes through the spirit box to talk to me. She's a part of my consciousness and a part of my life. And I defend her at every turn because she, uh, you know, unless somebody can prove to me that she was a practitioner of which, of rich, witchcraft, witchcraft, (laughs) witchcraft. I've been talking a lot, y'all. Okay. Anyways, um, which I was, I I just don't believe because she wouldn't be buried in hollowed ground with the rest of her family if there was any evidence of that. It's true. 
Um, and what she was accused of in life, had she lived 100 years earlier, could have gotten her killed up the road in Salem. That's a dangerous word to throw around. Even today, in some parts of the world, women are slaughtered because somebody said they're a witch. Hmm. I'm not saying that she, Bathsheba, was the most pleasant woman in, the, in life or the most pleasant spirit in the afterlife, but in some ways, she lived a tortured existence. She lost three of her four children before the age of four had this prejudice against her for years, and I can't even imagine the hardships of living in New England back at that time. So I feel compelled to defend her honor in the Warren's case files that The Conjuring was based on Mrs. Warren's basically, uh, basically blamed everything on her, but the real story is richer and deeper and more convoluted. They can't squeeze 10 years into a two-hour film, Andrea says. So I think that's a very interesting point of view on Bathsheba, and I think that encapsulates the... Uh, substance that it's definitely not Bathsheba mm -hmm. and though she might have been a bitch from hell she didn't um, you know she didn't try to torment but she had no family. reason to. exactly yeah. I mean even even in your 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 dark considerings of, of what's happening the motivations don't match the actions exactly mm -hmm. um, that does not forgive the concept of the name falling into the place you know, there's a lot of things that go on and something that a lot of people don't realize is that um, – and I guess many people do realize this. Uh, one of the first goals of like an exorcism is to learn the name of the demon inhabiting. Exactly. The, the, yep. You know, once you know the name. So no demon is, is like, I'm here, I'm Bathsheba. You know, that's not happening. Sure. But a demon could pull a name out of thin air and say – call me this you know as as a measure to ensure that they are you know protected against anything you might try to drive them out mm -hmm. you know um because i think that's something that's also missing is this this notion that well it's not bathsheba it's like well no it's not bathsheba sherman but it was a spirit that might ha might have identified itself with that name yep for the sole purpose of protecting itself from uh exorcism Yep. You know, uh, which gives you how diabolical this spirit might be because it chose a name that was maligned in the region that mm -hmm. had right. a bad reputation that you could believe was it. It knows what it's doing. You know, right, exactly. So, you know, it, it, it could have been, you know, Mrs. John Arnold, who knows the story of Bathsheba because Bathsheba was much maligned in that lifetime. Mm -hmm. and, 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 mm -hmm. and so it makes sense that... Uh, Bathsheba might be a spiritual nom de plume for a dark entity who doesn't want to be identified for fear of being driven out. Yep. So as crazy as it would sound is, do you think that this could have been an entity that was controlling every aspect in a very curated and specific way because they knew that a certain outcome was going to happen? So in the way of immediately planting the seed into the brain of Bathsheba being the dog, causing chaos around them in their neighborhood, forcing yep. them out to this house Absolutely. where Bathsheba was the name of this person that lived there, knowing that Lorraine Warren would eventually come. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Yes, absolutely. It feels, and that is horrifying to think that there is an entity that powerful. Oh, absolutely. yes. And, that can and curate your life like that. We, we talk about like, the the more diabolical and powerful an entity is, like if you get into, and again, we are not specifically uh, Bible scholars by any stretch of the imagination, or nor are we uh, affiliated through any religion directly. But when you come to the idea of of the old stories, which were there is a group of angels. They fell. Those are the devils. Those are the true demons. The, the fallen angels. The fallen angel concept is interesting because before they fell, they were a part of the the entities of knowledge, meaning they knew. Right. They knew mm -hmm. the path of 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 everything. You know the the book of life that God had written, shared with His angels, and they all said, "Yep, that's good. That's a good book." They know, and they are the only entities that truly have access to that information. And so oftentimes when people talk in those terms and they're like, 
I'm being shown pieces of the future. It's like, well, we used to call them prophets. Yeah. Um, but what they're really being do, they're they're communicating with entities that have the 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 book of of existence at their back. Demons that fell, they saw the book before they fell. <laughs> they point. have the ability to trace fate and alter it if necessary, but they can only alter it as far as the book will allow them. So mm -hmm. so there's so much at work when you start talking in that kind of lore and in that kind of storytelling. But when you really think about it, yeah, you know, this could go very deep and very, very hard towards, you know, even getting us mm -hmm. to go into this yeah. house, all a part of the same story, all a part of, 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 of bricks in a very solid fortress of awareness. And, uh, and so, yeah, that, that's, it's, it's both, it's both frightening, but kind of awe inspiring too. Exactly. So, um, Andrea also has some opinions on the other spirits in the house. Um, mind you, I know it's a lot of Andrea's opinions in this deep dive, but Andrea seems to be the spokesperson for the parent family. Um, she pretty much does every single interview. I really couldn't find any interviews with any of the other siblings. I don't think they really want to talk about it. Andrea seems to be the most open. Yes, uh -huh. I think Andrea about takes it. on the public persona for 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 the family and their experiences there. Um, I think there is there is one like set of interviews in the last ten years that seem to be split among the the children, but I don't know where that is exactly. Um, it, it's hard to find. Yeah, it's hard to find. It is hard to find. Um, so Andrea said, I was particularly frightened for my sister, Cindy, and what she was enduring. And I was especially concerned about my mother because clearly there was a spirit in that house that I think was dead long before Bathsheba was even born. Mm. Mm. An ancient spirit that spoke with a deep Scottish brogue. Interesting. And threatened her and used language that was already out of favor in the 1800s. She approached her, I think, during our second year. I'd have to go back and check the timeline on that. Um, but she approached my mother and she said, I was mistress once afore you came, and mistress here will be anon. Ooh. <laughs> of course, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. That's language that was not even used in the 1800s. It was already out of favor as the language evolved, and that was not Bathsheba. The only spirit that ever self-identified at the house is represented as a little boy named Rory in the film. Mm. His name is actually Oliver Richardson. He probably he was probably five or six when he died, and my sister April's age when we moved in. So it's not unusual that he would reach out to her. But when he told uh, when he told uh, her what his name was, we didn't even know yet that the house was built by the Arnolds. In fact. It was actually built by the Richardson family, and so there was the real connection, but it took another couple of years of research to find it. Only one of the uh, – now, when it comes to the um, broken neck lady, I think she's associated with that ancient entity, but um, when – uh, another uh, quote from Andrea is when we moved in, we met a very, very old man who was in his 90s, Mr. Mick Irk, Irk, Irkin? Irkern? Irkern? Seems like a very Scottish area. Yeah, very <laughs> yeah, Scottish. Seriously. Um, Irkern, uh, he labeled himself the town historian. Um, he just knew a lot about the original homesteaders in that area. And he said that it. Uh, based on his own knowledge and research, he believed that Mrs. Arnold hanged herself in the barn at the age of 93 oh. in 1797. I didn't realize how long before mm -hmm. Bathsheba uh, Arnold was. Exactly. Um, those were the dates that he gave us. We have yet to be able to verify that, which is the point. Exactly. A lot of times, it's that's why it's important to have these town historians, because they're the only ones who remember these things. Right. and. Um, there, you know, when you're in the late 1700s, people aren't just writing death certificates like that. No. They, it was just not a thing, especially in very rural areas. They, and probably especially suicides. Oh, very much so. You know, that's a good point. They wouldn't want everyone to know your how she died. Business, right? Exactly. Um, but she was the one who I think probably considered herself mistress of the house. She was threatened by my mother's presence there. She wanted us out. She wanted dad and us to stay. So she, whoever it was, the female spirit with the broke neck that approached my mother twice, she wanted my mom out of the house. 
I think she just wanted to live her life over again, vicariously with my father and us, the five children that she seems to covet. Um, she approached Christine, who, uh, and she approached Cindy, and she and Andrea saw her. Um, Andrea says, I don't think Nancy ever saw her, and I don't think April ever saw her. Uh, we almost had different spirits that liked us best. I don't know. I can't explain it. It's bizarre. And yet last night during a spirit session, because Andrea does go back to the house rather frequently, um, we were uh, having at the farm. I was there last night. And mind you, this article was written in 2022. And at two in the morning, what came through was Abigail Arnold, who be uh, who we believe died in 1865. She came through and identified herself, identified me as being present in the house. And then her direct message to me was, we miss your family. Oh, wow. And so, so there's still very much, uh, there's still very much there, these spirits. And we don't know why. I mean, what is it that keeps some earthbound while others go off? I speculate about it. And I wonder if it's because they claim their own lives and they're afraid to go to the, to the life because it might be the hellfire and damnation they were raised with. So they fear burning for eternity for hell and um, they fear to cross over or they died so suddenly and tragically that they don't seem to understand that they're dead. They're confused. It's, uh, I think it's a lot of things. And the more we study, the more we research, the more we communicate with them, the more we learn. And that's the beauty of what we do. Now, Abigail Arnold, um, from what I've gathered, she kind of serves as a guardian of the home and not a malevolent entity. Um, straight from the uh, website of The Conjuring House, Abigail was the daughter of Mar Martha Hopkins and Sylvanius Cook. She married John Arnold, uh, which was another John Arnold mm -hmm, in right. the family, in 1795, um, when she was 19 uh, years old. And they lived at the estate where John Arnold was a farmer. They had 14 children in 22 years. Uh, Abigail loved to cook and make fruit preserves in the ah, cellar. Uh, uh. Why she smells like fruit. Ooh. And she died of an illness at 93. Dago. The same age as Mrs. John Arnold committed suicide. Mm. I thought she committed suicide in 90. It's 93? Well, according to the town historian, oh, okay. she died in her 90s is what okay. the official okay, okay. statement is. But according wow. to the town historian, it was 93. Okay. And she was buried in Burrowville. She remains a resident of the house and will often warn guests to get out of the basement if there is a malevolent spirit around. She asks that all guests visit with respect. Okay. <laughs> so now you guys see why I'm saying that the woman who would tuck the girls in first was Abigail right. giving warning that the broke neck lady's coming mm. and she smelled like fruit. Right. And wow. Mrs. John Arnold might be the broke neck woman or yes. just some ancient entity. Yeah. Of, of, Very of, interesting. Of mm -hmm. the, of the property. Exactly. Mm. Um, now the big question that I can't, figure out for the life of me is these aliens the aliens i oh, my god i thought I, at one point i felt like i could find all this information on it and then i a couple days ago was trying to add some stuff to this about uh, when i was after i was done wrapping my brain a little bit around it and all of it's gone i can't figure out what happened with this alien content yeah. um to support our friends at uh, Two Girls, One Ghost, we went to one of their shows, yes. and, you know, it was awesome. And uh, they w w came out of nowhere with aliens. This is the first time we've heard of aliens with The Conjuring House. And uh, we all just kind of looked at each other. I remember we all just kind of looked at each other and were like, what's going with what? The right. Heck? It became like uh, on equal ground as far as they were concerned as mm -hmm. to the reasons why. This location is haunted, and it was like that's that's kind of new to me. It's new to me too. But I know that I have not like done a lot of due diligence with this uh, um, property. But it really does seem to be a spearheaded by Andrea Perrin. Yes, uh, um, and uh, I want to say that I, she leads like either workshops or 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 invites people to to witness like ufo phenomenon mm -hmm. um and it's fascinating because it is it is a totally and uh we've talked about this before a lot of times uh the paranormal community is split uh where people who believe in ghosts refuse to believe in ufos and people who believe in ufos refuse to believe in ghosts 
Um, and it's fascinating because it's like we are kind of dealing with the same phenomenon ultimately, which is something that we can't completely understand occurring in a way that we can't completely document, you know. <laughs> and I find it interesting because actually I believe it was in their interview, Andrea um, – <laughs> says that she's had these experiences with what she calls the Galactic, Galactic Federation. Galactic Family. Oh, that's it. Yes. The, Galactic Family. The Galactic yeah. Family, since she was a child living in the house, and that she would sing a specific song yep. to the sky, and these formations would come, and that's how she would call upon them, which is, I've never heard that before. That's Calling new. upon aliens in right. general, I've never heard of right, that. Right, exactly. Um and then also that they would come to her window. Right. The and, window being like the, the key of, yes. of, 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 the, of the communication with the extraterrestrials. Yeah. But the only thing I was able to find on the Conjuring House's website about any UFO stuff was this direct quote. Mediums, card readers, and spirits of the house have told us of extraterrestrial visits. If true, their portal is located somewhere in the lower field, from light orbs to a UFO video captured in 2021. I did not find this video. I don't know what this video is, but uh, allegedly it happened. And then also something important to note, too, Andrea said something about how she would know that they were there because there were these clouds that looked like fake cotton balls that's how she would describe it and through some people's spirit box sessions people were getting fake cotton balls and didn't know where it was uh, fake clouds fake clouds that came in through um to the two girls one ghost um yes they were using the frank's box uh which is frank's box was originally designed for communicating with extraterrestrials but we've turned it into the spirit box you know, it, it, it's using the same principle as a spirit box, but its original intent was to speak to extraterrestrials. And so having it um, talk about, yeah, uh, fake clouds, mm-hmm. look to the sky, mm-hmm. things, things of that nature. It's compelling. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about the alien theory. It's just so new to me, and I haven't heard enough about these alien experiences or any sort of although other... even the description of the broke neck woman's face being like a hornet's nest with dark sure. eyes with just little slit nose that kind of sounds like a gray you know it sounds like sure. you know one of those things you know stick hands stick figure you know um bodies you know so there's a lot to 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 wonder about in that regard and it also suggests, are we dealing with two separate types of events? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, is one informing the other, or is it the fact that the land is so very potent with some kind of paranormal supernatural energy that both spirits and uh, extraterrestrials are drawn there? Like, like that's how powerful a portal you have on that property. The property itself is sitting there as this vast portal of unknowable energy and so now you have demons and ghosts and aliens all coming because there is a draw there a magnetic pull now i i am in agreement on that i think this is just such a it's just one of those places on earth and there's this is not the only one on earth that's like this um you know where it just attracts everything it there's so many theories of you know how do aliens pick certain spots of why mm-hmm. they're active there so I mean I'm I, I'm in agreement that there's a lot of energy. So I guess you know aliens aren't out of the question. I'm no. just not going into it expecting to have an alien encounter. If we do, cool. Um, <laughs> but I'm more so expecting paranormal type activity, and I'm also expecting if we do encounter things that it's not necessarily going to be just this list of entities that we yeah, are discussing I agree now. With that. Um, because, like I said, I do believe that it is a portal, which means there are transient spirits, and that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Right. It could just be a solid flow, an ebb of spirits going one way or the other. Um, it is fascinating to think that this place has become so celebrated that it it, it puts it puts the attention of the entire world on mm-hmm. this single location for mm-hmm. these for for this type of activity. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful that 
what we get experientially is a sensation of the place, you know, yes. a, a sense of what kinds of energies and what kind of, you know, uh, maybe come up with answers of our own based on just experience. So one thing I am interested too, as well, is to see how Megan feels in yes. the house, because if you don't know Chris's wife, she's kind of like ghost repellent. Yes. Um, yes, she is. <laughs> she's, she's, so. she's the perfect cooler for a ghost uh, hunt. You, you're just like weirdness, weirdness, weirdness. Hey, Megan. Uh, I feel much more comfortable now. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm interested to see what her opinions are, because I know the former owners of the house before the house uh, was sold again, um, they said that the house wasn't haunted at all. Mm hmm. Like, they just straight up said that. And I'm like, there's too much stories about people outside of the parent family having experiences with entities in this house to not have some level of haunting to it. Yep. Um, and I just, there's too much detail of it. I'm like, the parent family can't lie about everything. It, that would be absurd. Like, that is a really... A 10 year web. block of time in which they have all of these incidents that almost, you know, fit tooth and groove together. And you're right. like, yeah, that's that's a difficult get. Because look at the Amityville Horror House, you know, spoiler alert, if you didn't watch our Amityville Horror um, <laughs> from One to Wicked a long time ago, they lied about everything. Yeah, yeah um, you pull the strings on that and it, com it comes apart very quickly. And so... That And if you compare something like that, their experiences were over a very short period of time because nobody, I don't care how great of a storyteller you are, you can't create that much of a universe around yourself and keep it consistent too. Right. Well, and have that many people in on it. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Because sooner um, or later, somebody's going to come forward and say, eh, that's not right. And so I, a part of me wonders if maybe the uh, former owners just were very um, good at cooling as well, you know? It's very possible. You know, again, spirits don't particularly enjoy uh, wasting energy on people who are either not sensitive or not going to give them what they need. The return. Right. You know, so some people are just that um, grounded. That you know, uh, no amount of of uh, ghostly currency can go or pass through them. So, yeah. and I think that's what happened with Roger. You know, uh, because Roger, although Roger has stories, Roger does talk about feeling caresses on his back, sure, and feeling because Roger's stories are of a man who's getting hit on. So he did not have a problem <laughs> at the house. He wasn't yeah. getting beaten or knocked down. Well, he did get he, beat one time, but he did get beat one yeah. time. <laughs> but still, I think that was more of like, "How dare you take right. this yes. lady on a date?" Right. You know. Right. And exactly. So, you know, he, he uh, he's getting the best deal yeah. because apparently he, on record, has said that it was an affectionate spirit towards him. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. Exactly. You do you. <laughs> you do you. Just uh, quit trying to kill my wife. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, but um, now, y'all, our opinions may change when we get That's back from true. this. You never know. Uh, but for the meantime, I think we have covered as much as our brains can handle of this house. And there, like I said in the last episode, there's so much of it that every time you go, and Google even just the Conjuring House, you're going to find a ton of new information and new thoughts and new experiences. So let us know down below what you think. Um, and I hope you guys are looking forward to the Conjuring experience. And remember to become a para junkie if you want to be a part of those live streams. They're going to be really amazing. Um, and obviously, it's going to be really fun to have the Ghost Brothers as well with us. So um, definitely ch make sure to subscribe to Dalen's channel as well, because I know he's going to be putting some content on his. So it's Dalen Spratt for that. But alrighty, y'all, let's wrap things up. So my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.